This is the vlog where I talk about quarterly stories, which is my graphic novel that I hand write, hand letter, hand ink, and then hand to you. Hopefully someday in print, but until that day, it's available serialized online at quarterlystories.com, where you can read it all the way up to page 50. It's a very personal story to me about faith and mental illness. And this is the vlog where I document the process and the progress of creating that graphic novel on top of being a full-time art director, a full-time father, and a full-time husband. We're uh, heading to the mall because this little guy needs to play. He's making a lot of train noises. And uh, yeah, and then um, after that, I'm hoping to get a few more panels inked on page 51 and, uh, and you know, probably mowing the lawn and stuff. So, pretty active day. Benji, do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, uh, but you are a guy, what? I... what letter are you holding? Oh! Wait. I can't even read it. Eruptions from yeah, these volcanoes also. the mall this guy did a ton of racing which was pretty fun for him and now we're heading over to Eliza's house which is his cousin's house and then uh, hopefully I'll work on some comics and you know maybe this little dude will get a, a tiny little break show the ball that you got Wow what color is it purple yeah you're right all right so we went to Eliza's house and that was pretty fun and Benji seemed to have a really good time. He played with trains. And now we are on our way home and uh, possibly going to have some dinner and then maybe make some comic books. Yes. All right, so you probably saw a little bit of the intro of the vlog and uh, it got into some stuff. I'm gonna show you a really quick video clip of me inking um, a little bit more of that page and I wanted to actually uh, talk a little bit while showing that video because I personally like want a little more content in you know, my vlogs so this might be a bit of a rambly one but I think that it's important for me to provide contact and content and today I'm just uh, feeling ready to kind of talk about something like I'm a little fired up um, so what I wanted to discuss today is that um, something I'm trying to work on in my art and in my vlogs as well, and it's a work in progress, so bear with me. But it's just that um, one of the things I like about Auto Bio Comics is it's a place, it's, it's like a space of writing where you can be vulnerable. And um, Jan was actually asking, he's a viewer of my YouTube channel and also um, an awesome artist in his own right. Uh, and you can check out his stuff at Yanimal. Um, and hopefully I'll remember to link to that below in the, uh, in the notes. But um, he was asking me kind of the process for writing my comics, like um, whether I pre-script them out, whether it's word for word, whether it's a pinned down thing that I have, um, or whether it's just like uh, something I just kind of wing and, and just kind of go page by page on. And I thought that was a really good question, and it kind of ties in a little bit with how I'm feeling today. Anyhow, I'll just be honest. Um, and. Part of this being honest thing is just trying to work on being more vulnerable um, with people who aren't necessarily like super close to me. 
I'm the type of personality, believe it or not, I do these really confessional auto-bio comics, and they're like spilling my guts on a page a little bit um, in the way that I'm writing them, because my goal with writing them is to kind of, you know, go to, into places where I feel uncomfortable. I, I, I feel like if I feel uncomfortable telling something, that usually is a good signal, at least to me, in this story. Although I have a, a story arc, and there's a purpose to my story, and there's actually a little bit of a moral to my story, but at the same time, like, and by the way, my story, meaning quarterly stories, the graphic novel I'm currently on, um, at work on, but one of the things that, um, to me, like, is a good signal that I should head in that direction is when I start feeling uncomfortable about something I'm writing um, because it's autobiographical it's like there's some stuff I don't want to share about myself like I look like a, kind of an asshole or I look like not such a great person that's kind of an area I want to head into is like in fact if I'm going to exaggerate anything in my story I hope I exaggerate my faults and that's something I really really want to get better at but I also realized um, before recording this vlog that I'm not so great at that um, in vlogs, like, I think that there is a part of me that, um, has a little bit of a wall built up, um, when it comes to vulnerability, and it's something I'm working on as a manager, trying to be more vulnerable with my staff, um, and more vulnerable with, uh, on my YouTube channel, um, more vulnerable at, you know, with my wife, like, Vulnerability is a really important trait, and it's funny because it's often viewed as a weakness, but actually I think um, it makes really great art. It makes for uh, good people, like people who are really just straightforward with how they feel and what they think. And, um, and so being a little vulnerable, I will just admit to this week feeling just really um, annoyed with the slow progress on my comic and like really frustrated and almost, uh, I don't know. It's just been one of those weeks where no matter how often I carve out a space of time to kind of work on this book, it just feels like it's making no progress. And you know, the more positive side of me hedges that by saying like, yeah, well, you're on page 51, that's pretty far. You know, you're gonna be releasing this thing you know, it'll probably end up being about 100 pages or 100 and something pages, at, you know, the first book. But at the same time, I like it feels like a slug-like pace. Um, and I generally subscribe to the idea of like slow and steady wins the race. But I'm constantly seeing artists that are like really fast and really good and. For some reason, and I think a lot of this is just my head convincing me of this, but for some reason I'll feel kind of frustrated and feel like, well, they do it faster, so, you know, what are you doing? Like, because I've been at this for a while, so I should be faster. And so, anyhow, so that's kind of how I've been feeling this week, and I know kind of what the alternative to feeling that way is, and I'm starting to work on that, like reminding myself of things like, I've been at this for a while, I've met a lot of people who work on this stuff. A lot of the time, the idea of people being faster or quicker at it is kind of an illusion, because a lot of it is just the amount of time they put in. However, I've always been a slower artist. Uh, when I was in art school, you know, I was in school with people, including my wife. Like, my wife draws fast and good and you know with a mild amount of revisions needed in the structural drawing underdrawing of her work um i know a lot of people who are like really fast and i went to school with these people my wife was one of my classmates in college and uh and i remember feeling really intimidated and stuff like that and what i would do to kind of try to keep up with all of my classmates was just pull a lot of all-nighters and just work like you know, try to work like a lot harder. And ironically, there's a couple things. One is that the people I know who are fast are still working their asses off and working hard um, because art is work. I mean, it is work to make this stuff. The second thing that comes to mind um, 
about my thinking on this too, is just like the illusion that if I get faster, it's somehow going to be better. Um, you know, the, the truth of, of at least what I see as like my reality and life and people I see around me and stuff is you have the gifts you have. So if you can draw, that's great. If you can't draw, you have to work harder than those people who can naturally draw. There aren't a lot of people who can naturally draw, but there are some people who when they learn drawing, it just clicks and the gateways are open. And then there are people like myself who like, I, I honestly, I, you know, I've had to draw wrong a billion times to get any good at this thing. And yet I love it and I love doing it. So it's just that that's kept me at it. But, um, Anyhow, so that's a rant. It's a little long. I think it's probably gone over the length of like the clip I have. Hopefully I can cover it with some footage of working on comics tonight. So I'm really hoping to have the energy to work on comics tonight. But we're in rush season at my work. And so, you know, rush season means it's completely um, chaotic. Like, and it's funny because I got out on time. There's not a lot of overtime. I've restructured things in our department. Things are a little more organized, and so there's less overtime required. However, it's just, as I've mentioned on previous vlogs, when you're in a work environment where you have to be firing on all cylinders from like 8 a.m. to, you know, 5.30 p.m., it, it it's like by the time you get home, you're pretty drained. And then after this long commute, which I'm in right now, it's just really hard to make art. And that's something I just wanted to be more vulnerable about because I think that some, I don't know, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I have been clear about it. And I think there's a hesitance to be uh, discussing that kind of thing because I don't want to sound like I'm whining because I know that's, that's just kind of the reality I live with. It's not a big deal. I mean, it really isn't. In the perspective of life, like, so my commute's long. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people who are like, you know, in war-torn countries without food and stuff. So, like, what's a long commute? I mean, I have a house. I have a family. I'm very blessed with a lot of things in my life. So, I don't want to come across like I'm whining, but I also don't want to put up this shield or defense, like, or, or you know, pose, like, as if I never get frustrated or annoyed by this stuff, because I totally do. Like, this week has been one of those weeks where I've felt like I cannot... Um, manage to get this stupid page done and I am so happy with my art like and I don't mean that as like a I, I don't think my art's amazing or perfect or anything like that but I'm happy with the level that I've gotten at with art um, but there's also just this other side of me that like is is really down about like just it takes too long this comic thing is kind of a pain in the butt sometimes so I wanted to just clear the air and mention that because my stories have to do with vulnerability. Now I want to get to Jan's question that I mentioned at the top. So how I write, I initially, I want to kind of get into how I used to write and then explain how that led to how I write now. So I know that like I was a fairly good student in English classes, in graduate school, like writing essays and papers wasn't that difficult for me um, and I'm not saying that to brag it's just one of those subjects I never really struggled heavily with probably because my mom was an English teacher so it's not like reading was something I was just around all the time at a really young age like you know maybe third or fourth grade I was reading full novels and I was a complete geek to the rest of the classes because of it because I was reading like these big thick books Everybody else, like when I was in junior high, everybody I knew was reading like R.L. Stein books, and you know I I was reading the classics. It's it's a it's a really weird thing. Or if not the classics, like my junk books were like these, you know, ridiculous like Anne McCaffrey um, fantasy novels that are like you know 800 900 pages long. And um, so anyhow, my point being, I've just been around vocabulary and reading and writing a lot. And I, I used to keep ex extensive journals when I was growing up, which I think is why I might have, you know, gotten kind of hooked on this vlogging thing, because it's like a journal in a weird way um, to keep track of things. But the point being, like, I've always been comfortable with writing, the process of writing, and 
I had like, you know, coming out of school, grown really familiar with how you do it. Like, you don't nail it the first time. You write, you get feedback from people you know. You might, if in my case, I'm weird, and sometimes I have to read it aloud to somebody to see if it sounds weird. And what's weird is it's almost like I just need the act of reading it out loud to hear it, to hear what's off about it. Um, and then I can kind of revise from there. And so that's how I approach writing before making comics. But for some reason, when I, when I got into making my first graphic novel, um, I never like considered that. I just thought that I'd wing it. And I think it's partially because I was really influenced by um, Chris Ware, who's still a huge influence on me. I think he's probably my favorite cartoonist of all time. And I honestly think he's a genius. Um, his influences are brilliant too, but I, I, there's something about Chris Ware's work. It's so prolific, there's so much of it, and he's consistent, and he writes stuff that's so good it almost makes me want to quit comics altogether because he's already doing it perfectly. So um, there's a couple, you know, there's a lot of cartoonists like that, but Chris Ware for me is one of those. So I was... Um, when I was an undergraduate, and this is before I was taking comics really seriously, I went to see him speak and um, at like a, a show called Masters of American Comics. So I'm dating myself. So now you guys can see kind of how old I was because that's when I was in college, right? Um, so when I was an undergrad, I went to see Chris Ware speak and uh, he had mentioned his process for writing Jimmy Corgan, The Smartest Kid on Earth which is his, his uh, kind of opus, like his first graphic novel. It, it's, it's, it's brilliant. And um, uh, he was talking about how he actually wrote it kind of a page at a time and kind of let the, the um, so he kind of wrote it like while roughing out what his pages would look like and kind of let the music and stuff of the, uh, the comic kind of structure the comic. And I might be remembering this wrong, but this is what I vividly remember. And so I remember something clicked and being like, you know what, that kind of makes sense to me. That's how I should write. And that's how I wrote my, my graphic novel. I had a rough idea of where I wanted to go. I hadn't fully worked out all the arcs or the beats. I didn't really know how I was going to end it. And as I went, the, the story sort of wrote itself. And um, that used to be my method. And um, so, so like, you know, I mean, I'd still do roughs because, it, you know, you'd be insane to just go straight to a page. Um, that's, that's one of the first things, you know, most valuable things you'll learn in any um, decent art class is that, you know, great paintings that you see in museums usually didn't just come from the artist's gut. And, and go on to the page. Well, most of them are meticulously planned, they're cropped, they're thumbnailed, they're re, you know, moved around, the composition's toyed with. At the sketching stage, where you're just roughing, roughly loosely working out the composition so that you have this great final piece. Well, anyhow, so, so that's what I was doing. I'd just rough, and then I'd go from roughs to just like a finished page. And, uh, you know, I didn't really seek a lot of feedback on the story from people. I did on the visuals, but not on the story. And so what I ended up with was, at the time, what I thought was a visually appealing comic. In retrospect, I, I think the visuals were suffering as well because I was rushing it. But I, I ended up with a story that just had a lot of plot holes and um, wasn't really concise. And also wasn't concise where it needed to be concise and wasn't um, thorough enough in areas where it needed to maybe have some breathing room. So it just felt really jumpy. And that's one of the reasons, like, even though I finished it after the publisher dropped off, I haven't really pursued, um, I mean, I did pursue publishers and stuff for a while, but in retrospect, I don't really want to pursue publishers anymore for it or really touch that work because I feel like I made the error of jumping in before I was ready. And now keep in mind, I actually encourage jumping in before you're ready over waiting until everything's perfect because waiting for everything to get perfect can 
plan and tends to lead to everything just not happening. So, anyhow, so that's how I wrote my first book. Because of that experience and because I was unhappy with the way it came out, I suddenly had this realization that I would talk to people about comics, and this is like back before people were familiar with comics. Like now we've got, you know, like Marvel movies every week, and, you know, uh, a lot of indie films based on indie comics and people are familiar with what a graphic novel is and um you know it's 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 like it's not where it was when I was in school but when I was in school like and this is when I was an undergrad um I used to have to meet people and kind of defend comics um as a valid art form because people would have a misapprehension that comics were only a place for superheroes and were only a place for you know, like, Sunday funnies and stuff, and I'd have to explain, like, I really believe these things can be fine literature, and just like any book, you know, a a book can be in any genre, it can be for kids, it can be on psychology, it can be on history, it can be fiction, it can be non-fiction, it can be anything, and comics are no different, except they add a visual element, which is even stronger than books, because you can use pictures to say what you can't say in words. And and to me, like, that was such a valid argument. I was very passionate about that. But what, what dawned on me was that I, I realized I was kind of being a hypocrite in the sense that I was trying to force people who weren't familiar with comics to accept the idea that comics were great literature. But when it came to my own comics, I wasn't treating them with the same respect and the same process that I would use and same thought and care that I would use when I was writing like an essay or a short story or a journal entry. Um, I mean, so I, I, I just basically, when, it, when approaching quarterly stories, I, one of my conscious decisions before it was to pre-script my story because um, I, I think it's important for my writing to have vetting to have some people tell me what's working, what's not working, especially trusted people. Um, You know, trusted people are going to give valuable feedback, not people are going to be like, well, this part sucks. And you go, well, why does it suck? What would you like? And they're like, I don't know. Or people who, like, try to get you to change your story to something they would write as opposed to refine it to be better at hitting the goal you want to hit. Man, I'm rambling. I hope you guys are following so far. I'm sure you are, because I'm not really, like, speaking in tongues or anything. I think it's pretty clear. Um, but, like, so what I decided... What it, my big realization was that if, if, the, if comics are indeed literature, if comics are indeed as valuable and as good as books, then I need to treat the writing with respect and go and, and use some of that knowledge that I learned in school about you know story arcs about plot beats about um you know rising and falling action um start using you know exposition in a smart way not in a cop-out way um you know show don't tell etc so so that's that that's one of the big things that kind of dictated the way i move forward with quarterly stories but What I also realized is my personality is one that, and also the visual nature of comics, um, does kind of require a little more flexibility with the story. Like, I can't, to me, I would worry if I were to set in hard stone an entire graphic novel that may well be over, you know, two or three hundred pages when I'm done, might get up to a thousand. Um, do I really want to commit to getting all of the words pinned down for the story? What if there's a scene that needs five more pages? What if there's a moment that needs some breathing room? And I didn't anticipate that initially. So, keeping that in mind, the way that I've crafted quarterly stories now is that I have a very specific um, idea of where all my plot points are. I know exactly the arc that 
my story needs to take. But I've left it flexible enough to where that arc can change. The ending most likely can't. The middle most likely can't. But some of the little points in between on the plot arc can can um, can work. So first thing I did was I decided I was going to tell a hero's journey story. So I'm using a hero's journey sequence um, to kind of map out what my story arc is. And um, I'm not using a lot of like colors or charts or anything like that. I just have it written down like these beats. So that's step one. Step two was basically once I'm writing a chapter, I write out the entire chapter as if it were a work of fiction or as if it were a novel. And the only thing I really leave um, in my comics um, that that's unlike a novel is dialogue. So when it comes to dialogue, I basically treat it like a script, but with the rest of it, I, I treat it like a book. There's another conscious reason because I've chosen to do this in first person. So in first person, a lot of the writing um, really needs to be worked out before you can go and kind of work it out in a different way. Um, so yeah, so there's that. So after it, all of that, after I basically got my arc, I've got my, I know I'm going to tell it in first person, um, and I've written out a chapter, I take that first draft of the chapter and I send it to a bunch of trusted people, like people that are close to me that I can rely on, uh, to give honest, clear feedback, not just, you know, compliment me, um, but give me actual feedback and criticism, but also not be dicks and criticize with no solutions um, because that's not a critique. That's just being a dick. So now that I've got my chapter written, what I do is I thumbnail a page at a time out of those chapters. And to keep things interesting, so I've structured the way I'm building this comic to keep myself engaged and interested so I can give 100% on every single page. So knowing my personality that I need a little bit of variety within my structure, but it needs to be repetitive and it needs to be structured, I have this whole system. And the system is I do a, um, I, I take my, my page and I block out the chunks that I'm going to use for a page. At that point I take the text and I thumbnail a very small sketch and you can see them if you're following my Instagram but it's basically just like a really quick noodle um, just a, a, a jotted down idea of what the page layout is going to be and sometimes that doesn't work but the great thing is because it's like a, a really quick sketch it's super fast to fix and fixing it at that stage when it's just a doodle that takes five minutes to do ten minutes to do really helps me to think out the sequences, think out the placement and the beats. And I mean, I've already kind of explained this in the past on this, the value of thumbnailing and stuff like that. But that's that's the next part. Then from there, I basically, um, once I have a worked out page and the way I want my page to work in a really loose thumbnail style, I start collecting photo reference and taking photo reference. Um, I use a lot of photo reference in my work because I want my work to come across somewhat realistically and um, and frankly photo reference makes it a hell of a lot easier to uh, nail foreshortening and other other things like that. Um, uh, I also, so I'll, I'll, you know, basically take all that photo reference and from that point, um, I will start crafting my layout. I use Adobe Illustrator to kind of come up with a rough layout. Um, and then from that point, I print out that rough layout, I draw my panel borders, I draw my, and then I ink my panel borders. I find that it's easier for me to, use, to do pencils on inked panel borders. I don't know why, but it helps me stay within the border, just mentally. 
So some of these tricks, you know, work that way. And then I sort of, you know, do my drawings, and then I sort of go to inks, and then from inks, uh, you know, I clean up my page, I scan it, I do the ink cleanup process that you can see in one of my earlier vlogs where I talk about how to clean up your inks in Photoshop. And then I, you know, save a version for print that's, you know, 300 ppi minimum. I think I've been going at like 600 ppi because it's black and white. And usually with black and white, they want higher resolution than, uh, than photo because the edge shows a little more. So like with alias lines, it's going to step ladder a lot if you have it, well, not a lot, but noticeably if you have it at 300 Whereas, you know, if you have it at 600, it just makes this perfectly smooth uh, line when it goes to print. Anyhow, it also makes for really big files, so I don't know. Um, so from that point on, I basically, you know, like save a JPEG for online and I have my print. So I hope that kind of explained my writing process. I got a little further than writing. But uh, Jan, if I didn't fully get into what you were asking about, let me know. Um, I can also say that when in doubt, when I'm writing and drafting those chapters um, in the writing stage where it's still written and not thumbnailed, I usually refer back to my story arc because I want to make sure that I'm gradually progressing the story to hit all those different beats. So I have a really clear idea of what the ending of the story is going to be. Um, as I've said, I'm under the impression that I think it might end up being a pretty thick book, a pretty long book. But what I'm hoping to do is once I'm three issues in, um, and by issues I mean just like three 32-page chunks in, which is 96 pages in, then I will release it as a graphic novel. And the 96 pages is just pages of art, but if I add in, you know, uh, chapter breaks and, um, you know, the, the cover pages and stuff, it's going to be a hundred and something pages long. So that'll be my first book. And then this might be a series of two or three books um, that are that long, that are that length. So, it might be a series of five books. I'm imagining that it's going to be a shorter series. But um, I also want to allow for space for creativity. And I also want to allow for the space to let that weird kind of unspoken thing happen. Where, you know, when I'm working on something like a good example of this would be in chapter one. Um, which you can see at quarterlystories.com. I have a specific page where I um, I draw a guy kind of looking over a bridge and he's considering jumping off of a bridge and it's a really kind of intense moment. But I was trying to, like, as I was in that moment writing it, I, I was trying to intensify the moment to get more emotional truth to it. And I realized that just having him look over and then the next page be the next action um, wasn't quite emotional enough, it wasn't quite poetic enough, and I realized that I had an opportunity to do some play with line that could really, like, graphically show uh, what I wanted people to be feeling at the time that they were reading it. So I actually have these panels where it's him looking over, and there's two big, massive panels, well, they're not massive, but they're big panels on the page that are just a, the water below and then the water swirling. And that's all a play I just did off of a few words that I had written in the chapter that just felt necessary. And um, I think had I had it all mapped out, all pre-scripted, um, I don't know if I would have been able to have the freedom to kind of extend that scene a little longer, to have that swirl of water. And to this point in the comic, that's one of my favorite panels, is the the panel where I did that. Um, so I don't want to suffer like from too many restrictions, but I also don't want to wing it um, like I was on my first graphic novel because I I know where that leads, 
and at least for me as a writer, that doesn't lead uh, to a fulfilling story or a story that I'm proud of. So anyhow, I hope that helps you out. I'd be curious to know what your writing processes are, um, Jan, and also just anybody watching this YouTube channel. Thanks for the question in the comments. Uh, for those of you who watch my channel, feel free to ask me questions regarding anything. Um, it honestly helps me think of content for the vlog, and it's fun. It's fun to hear uh, hear what you guys wonder about or what you're kind of wanting to know about. So now we're at like the 30 minute mark, um, and I am heading home to kind of work on comics after a crazy day at work, and already from vlogging, I'm feeling a little better about my day, and I'm feeling a little more positive. Like, I feel like uh, just getting the opportunity to discuss my comic and answer your question, Jan, um, really, like, actually made my, uh, my mood lift. So I'm feeling ready to kind of tackle some comics. So I'm going to head home. I got to, uh, it's my night to watch Benji. Uh, Thursdays are my wife's night off. And, um, I try to give her a night off every week. I'm not always effective at it, but I try. Um, so, yeah, so after that, hopefully I'll be able to tackle and ink some more panels and then edit this vlog so that I can get a vlog up this week and I'm hopefully a nice chunky one. Like, this is, you know, some extra content. So anyhow, thank you guys. By this point, you've probably seen all that footage, so I will just let leave it at that and close it out. I just want to thank everybody who subscribed, who comment, like, and share uh, my videos. Um, it helps get the word out, it helps me keep doing this thing, and it actually encourages me to do comics and it allows for moments like this where, you know, like Jan, because you asked such a rad question, it just opened up the floodgates of ideas for, um, for answers. So thanks to those of you who do that and ask questions. And then um, most of all, like I said, thanks for people who subscribe because, you know, uh, subscriptions uh, help keep the channel growing and they help to actually, you know, um, encourage me because it's like, it's nice to know that there are people who are willing to kind of know when I'm updating this. So anyhow, thank you guys. And I hope this wasn't too rambly. If you thought that it was too rambly, let me know. I'm, I'm here. I read every comment. Um, and I try to respond to every comment as well. So thank you guys. And I will talk to you later. And uh, I will hopefully see you guys next week. Boom.